So with that in mind, I wanted to okay. share this project, um, mm -hmm. just one project, um, is the frame house. And uh, I thought there was some some similarities with this. It's under construction, should be done by the end of the year. Uh, but this, this project is actually an existing uh, project. It's an existing house. So very much like how we got that frame grandfathered in. In this case, I got the whole house grandfathered in, right? And it's a modernist house from the 1960s. Um, so, I mean, the client bought this as part of, of um, um, uh, Crestwood Hills, which is kind of like a modernist enclave with like pretty notable architects from Ray Cappy to Quincy Jones uh, or a Quincy Jones, not the musician, the architect. Uh, to uh, Richard Neutra, to um, uh, there was another guy in there. Oh, uh, I, 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 um, I'm blanking out on his name now. Anyway, so I'll come back to him. But a bunch of modernist kind of LA architects were here. Obviously, Neutra was not from LA, but his career was in LA. Um, but this house wasn't that important. It was done by kind of like a third tier or third tier architect modernist. So there's nothing sacred about it. So uh, the whole thing that we had is like, this whole area has a, a, a kind of historical preservation. They want modernist houses. They want flat roofs. Um, but our client wanted to lift the roof. So how, how do we do that? How do we actually go like expand upwards? Uh, so what we decided to do is essentially remove the entire roof of the house. It's introduced this kind of steel frame to be able to hold a new roof. So you could kind of see the removal of the, of the roof. Obviously, it doesn't have these pitch shapes up there. The introduction of the truss and then the introduction of the new roof. Um, the plan is completely got it. It was very kind of fractionalized. And now it's like a big open plan with one bedroom and an office on the top floor. The ground floor is a garage, very utilitarian, a guest bedroom and a bathroom. Uh, so here you can see the profile of the roof as it kind of kinks up. Um, and then these are kind of model rendering or models of, the, of what the space would look like, right? With this kind of tilted roof. Um, here's the project under construction. This is looking the opposite way. Um, uh, as you can see, the truss and then the, the new structural beams. This is what the house used to look like before. So it already had a lot of windows, but we wanted to even maximize that more, right? To create even larger windows. So now the windows are going to go floor to ceiling. Um, these are more interior shots of the model to kind of give you a sense of the spaces. Uh, and this is kind of what the master bedroom used to look like. Um, these kind of very kind of bay windows. All the, all the finishes are very 60s. This house is, was not touched since the 60s. So it's like, uh, it's not even, it's like a vinyl floors and like aluminum windows. Everything's really cheap. Uh, and then this is what the new uh, kind of master bedroom would look like. So again, it's like the expansion of the, of the windows. But for us, it, this is a, a, it's part, this is going to be part of a larger lecture that we're actually having in two weeks. But, um, we're kind of interested in this idea, especially in LA, about the, the classical idea of modernism and what those buildings used to be that, right? From Pierre Koning and like, you know, all these all these masters from the case study house program. Um, and the, the, they're obviously second generation to like Corbu and like all of the modernist movements. But the more and more you see it, it's become so inapplic inapplicable to design that way. Like you can't really design modernist houses anymore because they're too thin structurally in Los Angeles, like our structural engineers require these beams to get so bulky because of our, our seismic uh, um, codes, right? Uh, we have energy codes that require us to have dual pane glass, right? So you no longer have these thin profiles, like everything's getting bulky, right? So it brings up a question to say like, is modernism really the right tool for as we move forward? Like these kind of like very clean, very thin profiles. It's not like Japan. We can't really do these super, you know, hyper, hyper thin kind of Ishigami like structures. It's, it's really impossible. So you almost have to go the opposite, right? And um, I know I know um, uh, Valerio Jati's talked about this, the idea that um, him and um, Christian Garris, the idea that um, in a way, modernism is no longer applicable to the new architectural modem, a modem but um, perhaps classical architecture is. Because classical architecture, and this is something Peter Merkley talks about a lot as well, uh, classical architecture is much more bulkier, right? They didn't have big sheets of glass, like windows were smaller. So well, this house doesn't do that. There are kind of, it is starting to say like, is this in a way the wrong way to look at modernist architecture and really think about it more? It's like things are going to get bulkier. Maybe the house should st start closing up a bit more. Uh, and, and with that in mind, the idea of kind of modernism in Los Angeles, was always it was always an idea of experimentation. You always want to kind of mess with something. I think it's much harder to experiment with the structure because of regulations. It's hard to experiment with uh, energy code. So instead, we're experimenting with materiality. So here, we're just testing out some raking of the stucco. 
And these are samples that we're doing ourselves, including doing the tools ourselves to kind of rake the concrete or rake the stucco. And there's me and there's Andre kind of breaking these samples. And the idea is that that would be on the facade, right? In, in a way, it's kind of very 60s, 70s to do these kind of break concrete, but it's more about how you catch the shadows and how you catch the light on the facade. To me, this is something that it's more traditional than the, than the 1960s. If you go back to to um, to kind of like turn of the century, 1920s uh, French architecture, there was a lot of architects like Robert Mallet Stevens that would do a lot of textural effects on the actual facade. And, and it was really not to create a pattern, but really to create, create depth on, on the facade itself. Like how do you create depth by just looking at the shadows, right? How do the shadows get casted on the facade? So in a way, this doesn't make a project, right? To me, this is almost like secondary or tertiary, right? It's like, and I always like to kind of layer information on a project. It's, you can read projects on a very surface level, but if you look a little deeper, it's like, oh, there's more to it. And if you look deeper, you might find even more things to it, right? Like we are thinking about all these things. Uh, a lot of times it's the things we don't say that we actually really love. We just never mention it. It's like, if you, if you catch it, then, then we'll enjoy it together. If you don't catch it, it's, it's okay, right? Um, so it's kind of a little bit like that. So this is kind of what the project looks like from the street side. It's very private. Uh, and then obviously from the, from the view side, it's very open. Um, and so, yeah, this should be done in a year. Let's see, let's see if they can finish it up. Huh? Can't wait to see that. Yeah. Uh, what, what was the first stage when you want to go to a renovation project? What's the first idea there? For approaching a project we found. Yeah, yeah. It was not like like I want to do a renovation. It was kind of like that was a project, right? But this is about as extensive a renovation as it gets. Like we didn't even just remove the roof. At the end, they actually destroyed almost the entire house. They brought it down to the studs. Part of the reason why we didn't want to just tear down the house and build a new house is because the lot itself is fairly small. It's only a I think it's a three thousand square foot lot. Uh, and the house is about 2,000 square foot footprint. So in today's standards, you would never be allowed to build such a big house for such a little lot. So we would have torn it down. We would have built a house that's half the size. So to grandfather that in, we're like, okay, we have to keep the periphery of the house, the, the majority of the structure. But once we opened up the house, we discovered that there was mold everywhere. All this, all the wood in Los Angeles, we build a lot with wood. Like that house is all wood construction. Um, so a lot of things are kind of falling apart. Um, and, and so then we just decided, like, we just kind of renovated the house from scratch. Uh, so it's about as extensive as it gets. Like, oh, there's almost no, no studs left, um, uh, on the project itself. Does that answer your question or? Uh, yeah, kind of, but I mean it in more general way. Like if you have in this renovation project, what's the first idea that you want to approach there? Uh, so we, we work a lot with exploration of multiple ideas. So it's not like uh, we never have like this kind of preconceptions like we know what to do. We talk a lot with this with even with our clients, right? Uh, a lot of times I go to, to um, I'll go to like a, to meet with a client, right? An initial kind of meetup. And they'll ask me, it's like, oh, like they'll introduce a project to me and they'll ask me, oh, what do you think? What, what are you going to do here? And I literally have no clue. I, and I tell them, it's like, I, I don't know. I have, I have no ideas. And it's not that I don't, like I'm also playing for it, right? It's, I have some ideas, but to me, they're so, so preconceived that they're almost not worth mentioning, right? Even though they might come back and I might develop them. For me, it's all about developing ideas through conversations with clients, you know, meeting their needs. And then obviously I have my own agenda as an architect to be like, I have a certain vision for the project, but for me, it's not set in stone. Like we're, we're very flexible. Like both Andre and I were like, we bend a lot to the client's wills, to the code, to the budget. And for me, I think architectures can afford to do all these things, can maneuver around these things. If you come in with the, with the strong kind of idea behind it, but that idea gets developed. It, it's not, it's not, it's not an initial idea. It's, a, it's an idea that you kind of discover as you kind of move forward. When we started the house, we actually didn't want to introduce a trust. We we're just introducing kind of gigantic skylights to try to bypass the idea of the roof, like just gig, like oversized skylights. But the client was adamant. He's like, no, I want, a, I want a new roof. So then we're like, all right, you want a new roof? This is going to create like a huge structural change on the project because the project cannot, um, like a new roof would be much heavier. So the project cannot hold a new roof. So we had to introduce new structure. So in a way that the trust evolved from that. So it's very much like an evolution of, of a process. Um, I should probably show more of that in a, in a kind of presentation. Um, 
One thing that I really liked was that for our past like interviews, we had architects through like the world that they start to experiment with new stuff, new material, new styles. Do you have any like tips and uh, uh, do you have any tips for our viewers to how to go to that path to start experimenting for newer like solution, newer material, like uh, how you can use different technique? Uh, it's a good question. Um... I don't know. I think I, I think experiment. I, I take every project kind of by one at a time in a way. Uh, like each project has a way to experiment, right? Like changing for me was an experiment. Experimentation. It's like how do you design a building on a city? I have no idea. I've never been to. Like it's really kind of a fictional project to me. So that was in a way it's exploration. It's like how do you design something that's socially responsible in a place that I'm not that sure about this society and how people use the building. So. There's a little bit of a, a surprise, right? You have to kind of, there's certain things you can control and then there's things you kind of have to let go. And I think that's something that Andre and I really enjoy. That's why we collaborate with a lot of people. We collaborate with Ted and other architects. We like the idea of like, we can kind of dance a song with, with, you know, like create a beat, but then we let the other person kind of take it over and be like, let them control it for a bit and see see what comes of it. Um, and I think that goes with the whole idea of ma malleability. Like I'm, I'm just not... I'm not so like caught up in like, it has to be my vision. It has to be my way, like, like drop the egos and really worry more about the project that like, I find much more enjoyment in architecture that way. Yeah. And even at the end, you see a better result in that way. Like at first, maybe you like yeah. struggle a bit, but at the end, there is a better result if you start to yeah. experiment different. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we do have kind of a methodology of how we kind of make buildings, um, that we've been developing for a while. It's not, it's, I didn't come up with this. I think it's an old kind of methodology, you know, how do you process a building? But I'm a true believer in like, in the process. For me, the it's the architecture comes through the process. It doesn't come through one single person or one mind. It's always kind of like, a, just like a general force, right? Like you you put energy into it and then something comes out of it. Uh, some of the projects that I've enjoyed the most to work on are some projects that I don't even know what I did to it. It's like, what did I contribute to this? Did, did I do anything? Like, who knows, right? Uh, yeah. But I like that blurred line to be like, did I say anything? Did I did I influence this project in any way? Like, there's something about it that I, I find really kind of intriguing. And and yeah, and since you mentioned something about uh, you are quite flexible in the way you approach design, and there's a certain malleability about it. Um, but are there like certain values and principles that you really hold um, into priority when approaching each project, or or is this flexibility itself is your uh, value yeah. in your approach in design? Yeah, I mean, I think for for me, it's at least personally, I've never tried to prescribe to any style. Like, I I I love working on projects that I have zero experience on. Especially like if somebody throws me a project, maybe a hospital is too much. Like airports are too much. But like I've done a central utility plan where it's like I have no idea what goes in that building. Right? But like, how do you de develop these buildings? Um, like I like strange projects. Like would kind of like like I would do. I would design a parking garage, but never never again. Right? Or maybe I do it one time and that's it. Uh, but just I like exploring these things, right? Like, like what is this monster? How how do you how do you actually process it? And I think in my experience, like I've done obviously small house renovations, and in my previous office, we're doing massive projects, right? Like seven hundred and fifty thousand square feet. And at one point, I was daunted by the scale. It's like, holy crap, these projects are getting out of control. They're too big. Um, how do you control a project that's that scale with, when you have multiple team members and? All these things. I think for me, again, it goes back to the process. Like I always trust the process. It's like architecture moves so slowly that it, you can't really make like rash mistakes, right? Even if you make a mistake, it kind of ends up working itself out as you kind of process the, the project. So in a way, there's not a lot of surprises um, in, in, once you kind of get the project moving forward. And then maybe some uh, final question just about the design. Uh, were there any specific things that you had to do with the arrangement of the layout? Did you feel like you had to arrange some of the things or did you- For the house? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it was it was really like client base, right? Like this guy's like a, sing like a single guy. He He's not trying to have a family. He doesn't, like the house originally on the top floor had three bedrooms, right? Technically right now it has two. One of them is an office, one of them is a bedroom. But I think this is always a question we ask clients, especially in Southern California, because real estate, this real estate market here is very aggressive. 
Uh, a lot of people buy properties to then sell it, right? Like they fix them up a little bit and sell it. So for me, I always ask clients, like it's one of the first questions, like hey, is this house for you or is this house to sell? Like, is this house an investment? Uh, because for me, it's a big difference when you're building someone's home. Yes, of course, you're investing money on it. And there's no other way around it. But it's very different when you're building something for you. Uh, I used to have clients that, that would worry about like, well, should I do this? Like, what's a retail value? If I do this, if I change this window, is that going to make me more money or less money? And for the most part, I'm like, look, you're you're already hiring an architect. This is already like a like a very kind of elitist thing to do, right? Not everybody can afford an, an architect. Like in, in in the United States, you have to be you have to be a millionaire to really build a house. Um, like it's so expensive to to do it otherwise. Like middle class people are not building houses with an architect. They buy a house, right? Ready made. So for me, it's like you have the luxury to hire a tailor, right? If I consider myself a tailor, I can make you a, a tailored suit like to fit to your body perfectly to you. Like who cares about who buys it from you? Because in, in California, the real estate is so competitive. It's like, no matter what we do, there will be somebody out there that's going to want to buy that house at whatever price it is. Like dude, you'll always find the, the, the buyer. So more and more I tell clients, like build it for you. Like you're like very few people have that luxury to say like, I'm going to build a custom made home for myself. And so when you start thinking that way, then it's much easier to make decisions, right? Clients feel a little bit more liberated to be like, Okay, well, yeah, it is for me. Then it's a it's a different kind of investment. It's a it's almost becomes a legacy project, right? It's something they can give down to their kids or or sell later, right? Like I don't think I've ever worked on a project that sold for less than whatever the cost of the original house was, plus the or the lot plus the architecture plus the investment of building it. Like the few projects that have sold after have always made more money, and and to me, I'm always kind of like mm, that's that's kind of crazy, right? It's like. Throw me, maybe throw me some percentages of that. That's good. Yeah, okay. Um, Maddie here. Yeah. No, I think Anton wanted to share some new stuff about that project. Like, yeah. Oh, let's see. No, I was just going to share some uh, of the construction shots just so you guys can see that it really, like we, this was, this is the second floor. So you could see all the, that we removed the entire wall, right? Like it's gone. <laughs> Like that's on the second floor. You could see how little yeah. of the project was left uh -huh. uh, after we got it. In. Um, yeah. Sorry. And was the was the new structure to carry the roof? Was it independent from the original structure or? Yes, it's independent. So yeah. you know we had to dig, dig all these piles in front of the house. Uh -huh. Introduce yeah. this new frame. We're essentially bypassing the structure of the house to pick up the roof. So we're creating yeah. a new frame in front of the house to. You know, with these kind of gi giant concrete uh, moment frames um, to carry the the steel frame on the roof, right? And so I think that was quite challenging to build it next to that, right? Yes, it's it's a small lot and it's on a hillside, so for sure it's it's pretty challenging. But we we've, we've done a lot of hillside constructions here in, in Southern California, so we're we're pretty used to this this type of construction. But I mean, you can see it's very piecemeal. This is very typical LA, right? You got wood structure, you got concrete structure, and you got steel structure. There's never this pure, like, you know, modernist idea. It's like, oh, it's all steel or it's all concrete or it's all mm -hmm. wood. Like right. the purity of material, at least to me, it's not, it's not even applicable. So I'm just like, I, it's, I don't get caught up with those kinds of things. It's like, I'd rather have a good building and, and like, so water uses a hybrid of materials, right? Yes. Uh-huh. And you be, you picked a like a reddish color for the frame. Uh, what was the choice? Yeah, so so it? this this uh, property has a lot. There's essentially an HOA. So this is kind of what I mean with forces, right? You have when you deal deal with architecture, you're you're always dealing with forces, right? The force of the client, the force of the budget, the force of the city agencies, and then sometimes like a, a lot like this is the force of the HOA, which is a homeowners association. They're very powerful here. So they actually give you guidelines of what you can and cannot design. Uh, so they'll they'll prescribe colors, right? But they'll say like, it needs to be earthy. Like like it has to be an earth color. So it's, it's up to interpretation, right? For me, I was just like, I want it to look like rust, right? Rust is earthy to me. Uh, I had to kind of convince them, right? It's like, so we want this kind of rust-like color, which is like rust comes from the earth and blah, blah, blah. And so then you kind of make this narrative, right? Uh, so that's kind of where the color came from. Yeah. That's so cool. Yeah. yeah. So this is just a primer. The green is it's not painted yet. It's going to be. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's kind of what it is. But yeah. When are you going to finish this project? 
Um, the end of this year, right? Yeah, un unlike the the Chinese construction of the Changjin uh, Pavilion, which they we decided fast. to build within a year, yeah. which was nuts. Yeah. Uh, it's China. <laughs> like this one, like it took us two years to design or a year a year to design, and it's going to be uh -huh. eighteen months to build it. They're about uh -huh. six months in, so they probably need one more year to to mm, complete yeah. the house. That's so um, they move so slow. It's kind of it's kind of crazy to me. But, mm -hmm. Yeah. But you have the luxury to edit the stuff during the construction. That's that's a bonus for that. Well, you're not supposed to. We try not to because it, it becomes expensive to change your mind. If anything, a lot of times we try to convince the clients, like, don't change anything because it's already been thought of. Like, we already yeah. thought about it. We already kind of figured it out. Like, you want to change it, then I have to think about it again. I think that's the hardest yeah. thing for an architect to settle their mind. Like, this is fixed. This is what I'm going to do. Yes, I got After a second, it. like, no, no, maybe this, maybe this well, color. But I think sometimes it has to do with, like, like follow your gut, right? Like, follow your, your feelings. Like, if you think it's the right move, I think the more and more, like, I teach at a university and I try to teach this to my students. Like, in, in the university setting, it's always like, teach me the rationale behind your, your intention and your moves, right? It's like, why'd you do that? And I'll give you some rational explanation why I came up with this idea. But for me, the more and more I, I do buildings, like it really is, it becomes kind of like, why'd you do it? It's like, because it felt good or because it looks good. Like there's really, it's as dumb as it sounds, right? Um, I, I don't know, I find that kind of like a little bit more liberating to just be like, I'm just doing kind of what I like to do. And it, it's not so serious, you know, this is not like a Princeton project. This is not like a, a Harvard GSD, like cerebral type of project. It's really more like, it's it's just based on kind of a process and conversations and there's a lot of stuff that that's not said about the project but that it's there um i kind of like that because then it, it gives the project a lot a, a lot of different narratives right i can talk to you about a project as an architect uh, i could talk to a, a gardener about the landscape and how the project relates to the landscape right so it's a different kind of narrative depending how you're talking about the project so uh yeah so since you email you talked about a second project that's why i prepared this one too it's also under construction uh we collaborated with atelier noise my uh it's actually my friends uh they based in shanghai and yesterday uh last year we uh we did this competition and we won uh about six projects in a row uh it's actually a group of projects and essentially all the projects is based on this island and it's all public and uh, primarily, uh, we are building for the visitors and trying to attract people. Uh, so this one is actually, we are trying to renovate this entire, uh, this pavilion by the, uh, by the uh, highway. But then you have an amazing lake, like the view is really beautiful for people to just stop by here, park their car. It's essentially just like a view vista. And there is already existing, really ugly existing structure with some weird tables and also this weird uh, panels. Uh, we don't know what that is, but it's like a really uh, bad scenario. So basically, they want a new uh, design to really reactivate this, this, this site. So essentially, we kind of uh, introduced this curved concrete wall to redefine the site. We kept the same amount of parking, but extended the existing structure grid for three and four bays and add a big roof to unify the entire uh, pavilion. So following the structural grid, we came up with a small, medium, large, and extra large for different type of scale of columns. Small columns could be just like little legs for the tables. And the medium columns, and these are all steel. And for medium columns, we basically use the concrete uh, uh, concrete columns. And we also, you can rotate it down, laying it down, and it become a bench. But we still call it columns. A large column could be just a wall with a bench. And the extra large column is essentially actually a tower, which is actually a periscope. Uh, so basically, we combine them all together, become a collection of the columns. So again, you will see here, these four little columns will form a table uh, for people to sit and with two medium column laying down at the bench. And similar as here with one table, two benches. And this uh, large column will integrate it with one cutout uh, light well and the uh, uh, periscope tower will just uh, uh, will will just sits in the center of the not center like uh, almost the uh, gravity of the entire building. 
So on the ground floor, we have two tables. Again, you can walk in here and walk out and just look up and uh, see the reflection reflection mirror. And on the elevation, this band is basically we are trying to use this um, rammed concrete, uh, this material, and trying to play it out, give a sense of a scale of the of the object of this big columns. So again, physical model, uh, this is a uh, um, made last year, and this is what we did. Uh, we are thinking about this material, this uh, rammed concrete. So on the section you will see here, there is actually this big mirror, which when you walk in, you look up, you will see that reflection, reflecting the beautiful landscape with the mountain and also the lake. And this is RCP, and we introduced the two different type of material. One is a completely reflective mirror, stainless steel, and the other one is a, a, a opaque, frosted, uh, half translucent, half reflective material. So this is a two layer of the material. So this is just still under construction. This is just some iPhone shots, um, and uh, this is another view which you can see the roof almost have can create this reflection of the beautiful view later on in the you know, good weather. Unfortunately, this day, today, that day was actually just a raining day. So uh, this is just another um, shot that we took uh, a week ago. And unfortunately, you know, the mirror still, still, they didn't, they still didn't install the mirror yet. So things are still ongoing. Uh, but yeah, that's a, a very simple, uh, another little pavilion that we are currently on the construction right now. Uh, can you see the view with that wall as well, or is it? Sure. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You can see the you can see mm -hmm. the view without. Uh, the wall won't block the view. The wall. So basically, the wall will be starting to grow and it will be really high on that end. But essentially, it's there to actually angle up. So they actually gradually start to grow, and until on the end, it will start to form a uh, like half enclosed space here. But uh, when you are in the pavilion, you can enjoy in the view all the time. That's so great. So this uh this project is so you could like make a stop somewhere along the road and then just um sit here and just in, uh enjoy the space. Yeah, or, exactly. Yeah, it's just a really it's a more like a like a view vista. I don't know for uh -huh. you know, in the US if you go to national park, there's a lot. Mm. Places you can just like that, there will be turn out, then you will just yeah. park the car and just enjoying the view. And yeah. this uh -huh. building is basically designed for that, where people can, yeah. you know, have some barbecue here, just to, yeah. uh, enjoying the view as a rest rest place as well. Yeah. Yeah, that's a interesting play of like this uh, certain collection of columns. So these are all, I, I guess they, those, some of those are not structural, right? Only the the be the small columns are the structural components. Well, actually, this, this concrete ones are also structural. These are rotated yeah. ones or non-rotated ones, but it's actually mm -hmm. all the part of structure. So the column yeah. is essentially actually uh, the location of the column. Actually, there is always a structural in the middle, but sometimes you know you have to provide the uh, the 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 uh, like uh, almost working like. A to not fall down, so so the concrete can play that really well. Also, that tower. So uh, I forgot the term, <laughs> uh, but uh, but you know what I mean. It's like so all the thin columns will actually collapse, but uh, you need actually stronger ones to hold the building stand up. And uh, how that idea of using that mirror at the roof come to your mind that one we are so basically it's a similar idea that we came up with uh, this uh sorry with this uh um uh, we kind of like trying to create this waving like because ram concrete like there's not always like straight it's like always a little bit of waving yeah and uh, for the roof ones we were thinking just trying to use a mirror so when you actually look the pavilion from when you're under side, the reflection can always reflect the water and also the mountain in the good day. Uh, so uh, unfortunately, I don't have the view from the straight shot, but uh, once you look at it, you stand here and you actually look at the view, the whole thing can just be, you know, unified. Your experience is not only the view itself, but also the reflection of the view as well. 
Yeah. And uh, we're trying to create this band is also trying to add another layer of uh, of a playfulness. So it's not yeah. like embarrassing like a mirror, like a, like Foster did for that for that crazy pavilion, but also mm-hmm. trying to create create this like a sense of a skill or also of making um uh in fact. Yeah, that's that's just they come there to enjoy the moment and the landscape. Yeah. Exactly. That's so cool. What's the uh what's the idea behind the um arrangement of these columns? Was there like a certain like the so this big column this has to be here. Was there like a certain uh how do you say um reason behind the the ordering of these columns? Or was well, it just uh playful, just a playful arrangement of the it's of so each? basically well the whole location still follow the structural grade. So mm-hmm. even let's say I have this color this wall here, but the, the grade is actually always like that. So even this tower, there's always a actually so entire thing is still on grid. If I do that, then you understand everything has to be anchored on that one point. Then you can just rotate it 45 or not. Then essentially we are trying to create like a different moment. One is like a, we study a lot, like playing around a lot of like locations, but essentially we think, okay, you can only house like two tables and on this zone. And this bench is good location because you can look out when you are sit here. And this this bench is like for people to sit here and also can walk out and look out. So basically kind of trying to create, even it's so tiny, but we are trying to produce like, this is also a tiny landscape here, little tiny micro garden. So basically we can have one, two, three, four stops, even in this like four different zones for this like tiny. Uh, little moments uh, there actually. Yeah, that, yeah, it's like, yeah, that's, exactly. you think that some different things and play it out, yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. it. And That's are these good. type of projects usually um, funded by the government or? Yeah, this is an all government project. And uh, in fact, it's also super low budget as well. So. When is it going to be finished? What? When you're going to finish this project? Like, in this uh, Probably in one or two months. We are working mm-hmm. with contractor uh, to finalize a lot of the details. Let's say added the mirror and, you know, my... If you look at this, con- the contractor actually this is from small town, so contractor is not as legit as you know typical LA contractors. Like, uh, honestly, it's uh, more like the town local local people, which they just you know do some very minimal stuff. So we're really trying to make something simple enough. Um, luckily, we have good ones, even though he sometimes he cannot read uh, architecture drawing that well. So it requires a lot of like coordinations. Like we talk like, hey, why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? And in fact, he actually uh, messed up this table. He actually, he made these two tables, but he put it in the wrong locations because uh, each uh, table, yeah. the lag is different. One yeah. table's lag is actually always in the middle. The other yes. table's lag is always, so this one is two double column on the end. This column is actually, we have a four columns always in the yeah. middle. But he actually completed it, made the wrong locations. And we, but we look at it and we thought, okay, it's fine. It's fine. It's, it's okay. It's kind of a, a little bit of surprising result and it's unexpected. But okay, we think it's architecture still there. The quality is still there. So we were just like, okay, like you already did that. We don't want to lose money for by changing this back. So yeah. we kind of like, you know, we have to be very flexible, also consider there. You know their uh, time and energy, and also their uh, their cost. So we just accept uh, it. It's like you're, you're yeah. fine. Yeah. Yeah. Well, sorry. Where was this uh, project? Where is this project located again? Uh, this, this is in uh, Ningbo, probably. which is actually a. Uh, this is in big island called Shangshan Island, which is close to Ningbo. Oh, yeah. It's got about two hours from Shanghai, the city. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. And was there an intention to be a landmark? Uh, by the way, you introduced the large column. Yeah, we are thinking, you know, we are thinking like at night and in the evening, it's, we want to clearly like people can see it, almost like a lighthouse. Like we want to, because it's, it's like a remote area, no one's here. So by introducing this tower, introducing this thing, the presence, we think we can give people, can navigate the people a little bit uh, when they are on the road. Yeah. yeah. Okay. The same thing, there's only one minute left on the Zoom. So. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, guys, this final 
question is from like both of you. And uh, what's your advice to the younger generation of architects that want to start their own career now? You want to start with this, that? <laughs> Let you not study architecture. Uh, that's my advice. Other than that, <laughs> it's too it's too painful, uh, honestly. And uh, you 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 did so much for so little rewarding, uh, in a way. But I mean, I'm, I'm I think I'm a young young generation trying to start a career, so I really don't know how to give advice to other people. I think Anton has a more say about it. But to me, it's like you really have to think. Uh, to me, I think if you are still a student. Try to think about how much you really are passionate about architecture. This is really the thing you should, will want to do for your entire career in your rest of your life. It's because it, just to be fair, I just think study architecture is really expensive. Like your tuition is expensive. Your computer, you need a really great computer, which is expensive too. You need them buying physical model materials is expensive. Printing expensive. Buying architecture books. Expensive. Each RFP uh, is like almost a hundred dollars now. So how much money you can make when you actually, you know, started working for someone, which is like something I don't think that everyone is talking about that in architecture school because you know everybody. Oh, I want to be a star. I want to be the top, but not many people can make that. And uh, most people just you know general, you know generic people. And uh, <laughs> if I can tell myself like five years ago or like 10 years ago, I really have to ask myself that like, you have to really think about it a little bit more <laughs> before you're really committed to this, to this, uh, to architecture. Yeah. Huh. I, I don't know. I think for me, like I, I kind of fell into architecture. It's not, it was never like a first choice, like, the, or like, since I was a kid, I was never like, oh, I want to be an architect. Like when I finished high school, it was really, it was almost like fill up a form, like, what do you want to do? And I was like, it was more like a deductive process. Like, I don't definitely don't want to do English. Don't want to like write. I want to do stuff with math. So at the end, I feel I got really lucky with when I entered a, a studio environment. I felt at home. I was just like, oh, this is kind of what I want. Uh, like, and I, I really live architecture. Like, that's, I travel for architecture. Like, it's it's really like, I, I'm it's in my veins in a way, right? Um so I think the advice I would give to someone is to to really be curious about the things that you like, like 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 promote that curiosity, right? I'm always trying to learn. Like I teach at a university, I'm teaching a grad studio, but all the time I'm learning from them. And it's not just me saying it; it's actually true. Like they put me to that's like, oh, I don't know anything about this subject. Like and it makes me curious to learn more about it or to become a bit more of an expert at something, right? So I always feel like. No matter what they throw at you, what whatever project they throw at you, like ignorance is a good thing, right? It's like when I'm ignorant about a project, it gives me curiosity to find out more. So if I would encourage all architecture students or anyone that's aspiring to be an architect to like foster your 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 curiosity. If you foster your curiosity, you like there's no stopping, right? Because you just like whatever subject you you want to get into, you just become a bit of a nerd about it, right? Like you want to become almost like an instant expert at it. Um, you'll never be like top level expert, but just enough to be able to have a conversation with structural engineer or with a mechanical engineer, whatever it is that you're dealing with, right? Um, I think having that like that drive, it's it's probably the most important thing you would have. And having thick skin, right? Like being that design director for a while and working for a design firm for over 15 years, like I was working for someone, right? And I, I think my first few years, I would kind of come up with ideas and they would get rejected and I would they would take them to heart a little bit. It's like, yeah, hey, I thought it was a good idea. And very soon after like a year or two, I really could just go like that. It's like, oh, you don't like that idea? It's like, I got 20 more ideas coming up. Like, I really don't care. Like ideas come and go, right? It's the development of an idea that's way harder. Uh, so once you kind of have an idea, it's like, okay, now let's develop it. Let's see how it can evolve. That I find much more, um, much more kind of progressive and much more, um, like thoughtful than just like raw talent or just like inspiration, right? Because inspiration to me is fleeing. Uh, I once talked to an artist, like he's a painter, he's like a good friend of mine. And I, I, in my head, I was like, painters must paint when they're inspired, right? It's like, oh, I came up with this thing, I'm an artist. And he's like, absolutely not. He's like, I paint eight hours a day, whether I'm inspired or not. Like I paint eight hours a day, like a job, right? Every day he wakes up, paints for eight hours, continues throughout his day, right? 
And he kind of mentions like, you, you can't rely on inspiration because inspiration is fleeing. But, if you, but you can rely on your process. Your process is a daily kind of dredge, right? Kind of what you guys do with your podcast. And truth, it's like, it's just like, just keep doing it, right? And eventually you, you realize like, hey, I'm really good at doing this because I just done it for so long. Um, so I think it's kind of, it's, for me, it's, it's all about process, like developing your process and just trusting your, you're going to make mistakes like everyone does, like every, every single person, every project's not perfect, right? There could have been something else. You just kind of have to let it go. You develop thick skin. Anton, since you mentioned you teach in university, what's your view about the technology and where are we going to end up? Well, <laughs> Actually, okay. these years it's getting kind of scary. Like Ted mentioned that this oh, with, is so hard AI to study and... for architecture, but yeah, this year... AI... yeah. I mean, I've always been a really slow adapter to any new technology. I'm not anti-technology, right? Like I'm, we do Rhino models and we do like everything. Like I'm all for it, but I don't use it as a as a tool or for the I always try to create certain filters for myself. So like our methodology here at our office is very old school, right? We make a lot of physical models. We print a lot, we sketch a lot. So it's very kind of old traditional ways of making buildings. I, I'm always very skeptical to things like the, the, the revolution is gonna happen through technology. I haven't seen it, right? I think architecture moves so slowly that even like this evolution of like, you know, like in the nineties, for example, like the whole like, um, like um, um, the whole idea of like, uh, uh, parametric architecture was like mm. the future of architecture and how buildings are going to be built this way. We're 30 years later. It was not the answer, right? It was never a thing, right? It's like, because to me, it, it always comes down to, there's going to be someone on site that has to put this thing together. I don't care how technologically advanced you are, it, at least in Southern California, it's going to be two dudes or, you know, like out on the construction site, putting a panel together. So all that technology to me is like when our when our construction methodology is still kind of pre prehistoric, right? For most construction, like houses, things like that. Obviously, it gets high tech if you're doing like stadiums, things like that. But ninety percent of the architecture is like fairly simple, right? Very systematic, easy to afford, easy to build. So when you start thinking that way, it's like the methodologies of architecture, the technology in architecture that might help us develop maybe faster or come up with more ideas faster. But I don't know if it necessarily changes the way buildings are made, right? Or buildings are constructed. Like that's an even older methodology about the master craftsman. So I don't know. I don't know if the technology is like the true like answer. It's for sure it's going to facilitate things, but I like old methodologies. Like, I don't know. Maybe I'm too old. I don't know. Yeah. It's, it's, it's quite an interesting question because when you say technology, I mean, all, I, all I'm thinking about AI, like all this mid journey, like this, this, yeah. this thing. And I, uh, I happened to read this article uh, on Architects newspaper uh, yesterday. Is uh, the they interviewed the uh, uh, Olivier uh, campaign, the French renderer who used to work mm -hmm. for Artifactor Lab. It's a really good renderer, and he has his big, you know, his official Instagram account, which is his rendering firm. And he's also using his Olivier County. He's a this low res with a low res logo, and he's just using Mid Journey and to test out the AI images, which is kind of there. I think there are a bunch of people on Instagram are doing that, and they are trying to use Mid Journey and training it and to test out a different design studies, and that's slightly interesting to me. But not necessarily say I will trust AI to design something, but it's more about how to use AI. I wish AI can be integrated to, let's say, the rendering software, so we don't have to always struggling to spend hours and detailing a model or you know adjusting the rendering lighting qualities, lighting factors to create nice images. I uh, I just. Uh, wish technology can help us on the production level so things can be easier and uh, ultimately i still believe i don't think you know ai i can't trust ai or chat gpt to design building or to define the aesthetics maybe there will be interesting sparkling uh new stuff that they can brought up but uh i just thought we can use ai as a tool to facilitate us to make things cheaper and easier that'd be that'd be great for technology yeah that's that's true yeah, yeah. But, but you can't believe it yeah. i have like 
poor client last year that showed me a mid journey picture and they said no, I want something like that <laughs> then you have to explain them this is not going to work the depth is wrong the like perspective is wrong the view is wrong you see a good picture but zoom in it this is not it's not even possible then exactly. you have to talk to them to them okay I can do a better concept for you just give it to me <laughs> and be at this yeah, there's only one thing I thought is interesting. I don't know if it's technology. I don't know if it's really related to the question, but I thought like this new round of the rendering style aesthetics. It's, it's. I don't know. I don't know if it's right or wrong. Anton, you can also correct me. I I don't know. But like the Bruther or Muto, this French architects, they started this like a new wave of the this. I call this like new high tech, like this very thin members or bulkers. Or even the Banku or like all these like European young firms are trying out this new aesthetic. But essentially they all kind of like always collaborate with Artifactory Lab, this rendering company, who produce amazing, amazing, beautiful images like the Bruther, the Elko Cave, like a half of the book or their renderings. I was almost thinking like a, most times the is architects is dominant the aesthetic of renderings, but somehow I don't know if it's when we come back to influence other people to do in a similar style or in a static way, because I know they're using Cinema 40 or 3D Max plus Corona. It's this engine. Uh, does this rendering software start to affect our design? And if that's the case, then would AI would actually change us in terms of aesthetic in the, let's say, 10 years later? I don't know. It's just the, I'm just thinking about it, but I, I don't know the answer, but I just start to notice this new aesthetic uh, change shift. Yeah. So far, it just gives you the yeah. combination of different people artwork, like other rendering is going to combine other renderings and gives you a sample of them, not anything new, like basically it's doing that right now. Do you guys think that we are in danger maybe 50 years from now? Or even oh, like hundred. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I think fifty is so much I'm longer. Sure come down. Die in fifty years. But, no? but for me, I feel like the, like these things are like there's gonna be so many other things that are gonna be affected by AI. Like architecture to me, it's, it, it. I always rely on just how slow it is. It's so slow that it's like it's gonna be the last to adopt all these things. It's like there's gonna be changes that are gonna happen through the world. Like I would expect more financial changes to happen like globally before like. Because if you look at how we're making buildings, it's like from America to China to Mexico, and we're kind of doing the same thing. Uh, it's still following kind of modernist ideals. Like, you know, there it's kind of like a hybrid weird version. We're kind of referencing old architecture, you know, like there's really no, I don't even know if there's going to be a new kind of movement, let's say, or a consensus of a movement. I think everything's so fragmented that like everyone's kind of dancing to their own beat. Um, if anything, I can see like a going backwards more towards like region regionalism, right? Or, or the 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 almost like rejection of technology and say like, you know what, we we actually lost something. And I've noticed this even not technology wise, but it, it is kind of tied to technology. Maybe not so much AI, but the idea that globalization has created the generic city, right? You, especially in the states, you go to LA, you go to Las Vegas, you go to Phoenix, you go to Seattle. It's starting to look the same, like the same housing block, the same like concrete base. Five over five over one, right? Like but five five housing blocks over one concrete base. They look identical. So I feel like we're losing like city identities through this. So for me, I don't know if it's like technology is not gonna solve that. The technology is gonna make it more generic, right? Like because it's AI is sample based, right? It's sampling whatever people like. So it's sampling those things. It's not really, it's not generally generative or it's not really creating something that's more thoughtful about like with the thought process of history of a region, right? To be like, hey, maybe we should, maybe we should slow down. Like maybe this globalization is not, it's not a good thing. And I, I struggle with this, right? I've, many times with this Chinese project, I was like, I have no business designing a project in Shenzhen, like zero business, right? Like, why am I even designing that? Why am I even partaking on that? Like, I, like I have no idea what the culture, like no part of it, but at the same time, I'm an architect and it's like, yeah, I can come up with something, right? It's like, I don't know, but I do find a, a I do find like an internal conflict with these things. Um, I, it's, there's no resolution. I'm, I'm going to continue making buildings, of course, but mm -hmm. it's definitely like with a heavy heart sometimes, like, like, or just a thoughtful heart, right? To be like, is it really, is this right, what we're doing? And that's just not just me. It's like every architect, right? More architects are traveling the world, doing buildings in other cities. And, it, and generally, it's a good thing to do this because you get it, like the cities get exposed to other types of architecture, which is, which is great. 
But I don't know if that's a false uh, that's a false statement because they, because they look the same at this at the end you're like everything's starting to look kind of generic. Yeah, yeah, and it's true about well you said about regionalism. I mean, in our last uh, podcast we did, we interviewed someone from Thailand who still his regional type of and traditional type of architecture still survives up to up to this day, even mm -hmm. uh, like a hundred years after the right. conception of. Modern yeah, or just even vernacular architecture, right? Like yeah. I find that fascinating. And there's yeah. like books that I like I always end up referencing. Like there's a book, uh, it was I think done in the 80s, like architecture without architects. Um, like it's fascinating. That stuff that's there, it's like it is architecture, it's just not a formalized, like school yeah. like, doc indoctrinated version of what architecture yes. is. And I even blame, like, I tell that to my students, like, I'm like I'm here to teach you about architecture, I'm here to indoctrinate you on a way of thinking. And yeah, it's very strange to me because I like. I'm I'm starting to realize like maybe we're like maybe it's all wrong. I don't know. Like I'm having some doubts, I guess, maybe. Mm -hmm.